an indigenous designer is being slammed by her competitors also. It's always so busy, the bus just drives by you. For daily people, this is a little expensive. Transit riders tell campaigning politicians what they want to see out of this election. And meet Bonnie and Henry, an eight-legged tribute to BC's top doctor. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, thanks for joining us. A Vancouver fashion designer is facing a torrent of criticism from her competitors tonight. Chloe Angus uses First Nations art in her clothing and says her company is partly Indigenous owned. But Angus isn't Indigenous and as Bethany Lindsay reports, she's the sole owner of her company. When the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge visited BC, they received a gift of blankets, wraps and bow ties, all covered with the art of coastal First Nations, all designed by Chloe Angus. Then Premier Christy Clark dressed exclusively in Angus's clothing. Angus is white, but she licenses the work of Indigenous artists. My part as a non-Indigenous person in this space is to bring together as many people um, to be able to wear and respect uh, this culture that we have here. Today, she's facing serious criticism from Indigenous designers who say she's misrepresenting her company and appropriating their culture. I know that from a capitalistic standpoint, when you license designs from a person, it's a business agreement and that's all above board. But where we look at it, it's not just about business, it's about who we are as a people. Angus has claimed her company is more than 50% Indigenous owned, jointly held with her Métis husband. But that's not true. The company is a sole proprietorship, owned by Angus alone. After CBC reached out to Angus for comment, she changed her website. Now it says her company is a family business. It's not change, it's growth. It's growth of the Spirit Collection and people wanting to know why I do what I do and how I do it. But there's more to the criticism. Angus has said she started this work to create clothes for the average white lady because many Indigenous designs are too bold for them to pull off. For somebody to say that they design particularly for white people and that they're kind of better at it, I find that very offensive and somewhat racist. Dorothy Grant has been incorporating her Haida heritage into fashion for three decades. There's a long history of of abuse, of, of theft, uh, of everything um, that belongs to Indigenous people. And this is uh, another format of that, of taking. Angus is aware of the criticism. It is a very racially motivated time. And I have been an ally in wanting to support Indigenous people and Indigenous businesses since I was a young person. Angus says she has no plans to change how she operates, but she's open to collaborating with her critics. That doesn't seem likely. And what would I like to see her do? Stop. <laughs> Bethany Lindsay, CBC News, Vancouver. The leaders of 13 of BC's biggest cities of all political stripes have put forward their priorities for this provincial election. Self-described as an ad hoc group of urban mayors, they've compiled the collective pitch to the provincial politicians, but their call to action letter is short on details. Our Tanya Fletcher is live now with more on this. Tonight, Tanya, so what exactly do they want? Well, they want funding and they want certain issues to be prioritized, but they haven't explicitly tied any detailed dollar figures to their requests. Instead, their letter calls for all of the leaders to commit to four things, addressing mental health and addictions, a new funding framework for municipalities, and greater investment in public housing and public transit. We tried to ask what specific funding requests they had. For example, will TransLink be given the $1.6 billion extra to extend 
extend the Expo line from Surrey to Langley? And should billions more dollars see the rapid transit line go all the way out to UBC or disperse to other transit projects? But we were told they wanted instead to focus on the broad requests in their letter. So I then followed up with Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart in particular afterwards to find out if he's going to try to leverage any asks during this election campaign. He says they're actually waiting for the parties to put forward concrete proposals in their platforms. I mean, I've run in a lot of elections. Your job is to propose. So we've really posed the problem here. We've said the areas we need the most help in, and now it's up to them to come back to us and say what they're willing to do about it. The ball's in their court at the moment. Uh, we've got together. I, I don't think this has happened before in an election. He is hopeful they'll be able to drill down to refine some of their requests to lobby for more specifics over the course of this campaign. Okay, so what are the party leaders then committing to in terms of funding public transit? Yeah, we'll have a tepid request. You'll get a tepid answer. Uh, overall, the mayors want all of the parties to commit to more stable, long-term funding for public transit. So will they? We asked them. Here's what they said. We'll be talking more about transit in the days to come and how it needs to be supported, particularly through the COVID pandemic when we've seen ridership drop by 70% and more. We have to get the system through the pandemic and improve it. Uh, we're matching federal dollars to make sure that we can keep BC Transit and TransLink as solvent as we possibly can as we see ridership come back up. So that's on the operating side. With respect to the capital projects, we are going to be redoubling our efforts to focus on building more transit. Transit uh, is essential for people to be able to thrive in their communities. And we have to ensure that it is uh, sustainably funded and that it serves the need that it needs to serve in community. So once again, stay tuned for hopefully more concrete details to be unveiled on the campaign trail. Leanne, Mike? Okay, we will stay tuned. Thanks, Tanya. And while politicians are vaguely saying what they hope for transportation-wise... We sent Mickey Cowan out onto the streets to see what everyday transit riders want. When it comes to transit, there are some common issues that really irk riders. The lineup is around the corner. Every 10 minutes, there's at least 70 people at the bus stop. Overcrowding, a major concern. And it's always so busy, the bus just drives by you. And then there's the price. So for daily people, this is a little expensive. I think there should be a subsidy for low-income people. No, it's good for pensioners. Some questioning why the Broadway SkyTrain line is moving ahead, while the Langley line still faces funding uncertainty. A lot of people can't afford to buy in the city and everybody's buying out in the suburbs in Langley and they work in Vancouver or Surrey and they got to bus it and it's an hour ride. So many people are doing in Langley work and from Langley to Surrey. So we should be uh, talking about on this matter also. Yeah. Many would like to see more trains and buses so there's less waiting, especially at some of those smaller stops. The bus route that I take uh, that goes to my place, yeah. it um, stops running really early and so I have to take a taxi sometimes. Each train only can take a fair amount of people and the rest of the people have to wait until the next train. And if I have a more train running in between, then not waiting. And while they do have their complaints, overall, many are pretty grateful for the service they do have. The service is cool. But service is good. It's on time, never late. As for whether these riders will get some of the upgrades they're asking for, we won't find out until British Columbians select their next government at the ballot box. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Surrey. And on the campaign trail today, the NDP made one of its first big promises if re-elected. Leader John Horgan was in Surrey to announce $1.4 billion over the next decade to improve long-term care homes. Oregon says the money will be used to build new facilities, improve pay for workers, and to help seniors live more comfortably. We can eliminate multi-room facilities in British Columbia. I believe seniors in their latter years should have the dignity of one room with just them in it. That's a goal we're gonna set. It's gonna take us some time. Meanwhile, Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson was in Port Moody responding to allegations of voter fraud made against his party's nomination for Surrey Fleetwood, Gary Tind. Tind and his team are accused of contacting people to get their personal information to sign them up for mail-in ballots. Well, I first heard about this about half an hour ago, and I understand it's been reported to Elections BC. 
And of course, as this mail-in ballot phenomenon uh, gets the attention of the public and the voters, there's going to be some confusion. But we have to be clear that it's the obligation of candidates to follow the law, and we expect that of them. And as this uh, unfolds, we'll see if Elections BC has a position that we will, of course, respect. And Green Party leader Sonia Furstino was in Victoria announcing more candidates, including Nicole Duncan for the Oak Bay Gordon Head Riding. That seat used to be filled by previous party leader Andrew Weaver. Another ca candidate turning heads for the Greens, 17-year-old nominee Kate O'Connor, who is running in Saanich South. She will turn 18 before Election Day. Uh, but do not let that fool you. This young woman has everything she needs to be an incredible representative for her community and importantly for her demographic, for young people who are terribly underrepresented in our elected governments. And the Green Party plans to make its own announcement on long-term care homes tomorrow. And the BC government and Dr. Bounty Henry are reporting no new COVID-19 deaths in the past 24 hours. However, hospitalizations have risen slightly since yesterday's update. 72 people are now in hospital care, the most since May 8th. 21 of those patients are in intensive care. Active cases are up slightly to 1,284, and there are 125 new cases today. However, BC's positivity rate remains low. There were 9,752 tests yesterday, the most yet. That means the rate was 1.4%, the eighth straight day it's been under 2%. And starting today, passengers on BC ferries are no longer allowed to stay in their cars on enclosed decks. A temporary Transport Canada measure to allow for that during the pandemic is now over. If we see a, a customer multiple times uh, not complying with the regulation, BC ferries could issue a ban. Uh, alternatively, Transport Canada could issue they would start at, it's my understanding, $600 and could go up to $12,000. But first of all, warnings will be issued. BC Ferry says it will accommodate requests for travelers with special needs. Transport Canada says it isn't safe for people to be in their vehicles on decks that aren't open. The agency says it feels adequate measures are now in place on board ferries to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Well, months after a bizarre and alarming phone call to a care home that was the scene of one of BC's largest COVID-19 outbreaks, a man has been charged. And our Dan Bird joins us live in studio with more now. So, Dan, who is the suspect that we're talking about? His name is Tamor Agtai. He's 26 years old. The RCMP says he's now been charged after a hoax call to the Lynn Valley Care Centre in early March. The centre said at the time it received a mysterious call. It says compromised health and safety of residents and staff on the same day it recorded Canada's first death from COVID-19. At the time, the care home said the call appeared to come from health authorities. Staff said the caller pretended to be a health officer, exaggerated the number who had, of people who had tested positive at the home, and said they would have to shut down. Care home staff also said the caller told them residents and staff shouldn't leave nor incoming staff go in. That led to some workers not showing up for their shifts, and that meant some employees were on shift for 16 hours. Mounties later arrested a suspect. Now they say Tamor Agtai has been charged with conveying a false message with intent to alarm. His next court date is set for tomorrow in North Vancouver. Court records indicate a man with the same name as Tamor Agtai goes by at least seven aliases. By the time the outbreak at the Lynn Valley Care Centre was declared over in May, 20 residents had died from COVID-19. Leanne, Mike. All right, Dan. Dan Burrett reporting live tonight. Thanks. A man convicted in a controversial case involving a speeding driver who killed a doctor in 2015 has now been sentenced. Ken Chung was given 18 months in jail for dangerous driving causing death. Chung's silver Audi was doing nearly triple the speed limit before it hit Dr. Alphonsus Hui's red Suzuki at 41st and Oak. Hui was killed instantly. The sentence comes at the end of a long legal battle that made it all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. Chung has also been handed a five-year driving suspension. Coquitlam RCMP are once again appealing for more victims to come forward with information about Raymond Howard Gillardi. Their last appeal in July led to seven additional charges being laid this week. 
Gilardi is now being charged with a total of 13 counts of sex assault and sexual exploitation. The latest relate to allegations dating back to the 1970s and 80s. He's also facing charges relating to incidents as recently as 2007. According to RCMP, Gilardi offered therapy sessions to young people. He also went by the name Dr. Ray Gilardi. Police are now opening up their investigation to other churches around the Lower Mainland. Anyone with information should call Coquitlam RCMP. A Canadian has died after a salmonella outbreak linked to pig-eared dog trees. That's now being investigated by the Public Health Agency of Canada with infections occurring in B.C., Alberta and the Yukon. So far, there have been eight confirmed cases across the country with five right here in B.C. Individuals became sick between late February and early August. The products come from Ontario-based company Master's Best Friend. Those who became sick say they fed their dogs Paws Up and Western Family brands of the treats. There are, they are no longer being sold but could still be in pet owners' homes. Officials say the best way to protect yourself is to wash your hands after handling dog treats. Well, people across BC are wearing orange shirts today. It's to recognize the province's history of residential schools, the trauma they inflicted, and the strength of the Indigenous people who were forced to attend. Hey, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, orange Shirt Day serves as a reminder that the abuse perpetrated at those institutions affects many survivors and their loved ones to this day. And for some, the occasion is part of the healing. Between the 1870s and 1990s, an estimated 150,000 First Nation, Inuit and Métis children attended residential schools established by the Canadian government and run by the church. As many as 6,000 people died in those schools. It was terrible. The punishment we got, I don't want to remember. It's really drawing awareness to a bigger issue that affects our people with intergenerational trauma. Orange Shirt Day has been marked in B.C. since 2013. Vancouver City Council has approved new Granville Bridge connector and Drake Street improvements for safer and more accessible walking and cycling across the bridge. Due to the financial pressures of the COVID-19 pandemic, Council shrank the budget to $12.5 million, down from $25 million. The upgrades to the bridge will connect with the Arbutus Greenway on the south side of the bridge and connect with the downtown cycling network. About 100,000 people and jobs are in walking and biking distance to the Granville Bridge, but few people use the narrow sidewalks or bike across because they feel unsafe. And Johanna Wagstaff joins us now with a first look at the forecast. So Joe, not a bad hump day, but bit hazy out there and I can see there's beautiful orange skies I mean it is beautiful but of course the smoke Yes, it is true. Uh, we do have the fine particulate matter to thank for a glorious sunset. Uh, and air quality levels are not actually that bad right now. This is all high level stuff, but yeah, what a stunning sunset. Uh, a lot of us waking up to that red sky this morning, worried that it was going to be a repeat of two weeks ago. Very eerily similar start to the situation uh, we saw two weeks ago. But Environment Canada is saying the uh, particulate level we're, de we're dealing with right now, 10 to 20 times less than what we had two weeks ago. And I've been checking the air quality health index, still very low across Metro Vancouver. Let me show you the temperatures out there. That is the other part of their story, of our story, under this massive ridge of high pressure, bringing us uh, temperatures that are a good five degrees above seasonal for Metro Vancouver. That ridge is just collapsing slightly. In fact, it's almost looping back in on itself. So I am tracking some cloud for Thursday, along with continued hazy skies. But that ridge will rebuild for the weekend. So I'll take you through a summer-like forecast. We'll talk more about the smoke and uh, the fires that it's coming from coming up. All right, talk to you again in a bit. Thanks, Joe. Well, a rare honor for BC's top doctor to tell you about tonight. Okay, make that two honors, and they are <laughs> adorable. Meet Bonnie and Henry, two Labrador Retriever puppies who will one day be guide dogs. They're so cute. They've been named in tribute, of course, to BC's provincial health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry. The BC and Alberta Guide Dogs Agency announced the names after the birth of this litter of 10 future service dogs. Like their siblings, Bonnie and Henry will be trained to help people who are blind, visually impaired, have autism, or are veterans with PTSD. 
It's the latest, and as Leanne says, definitely the <laughs> cutest honor for Dr. Henry for her calm guidance while leading BC's COVID-19 response. I love that they're going to do some good for the community, just yeah. like Dr. Henry. So that's very great. calm and relaxed there. Yes, they are. <laughs> All right. A reminder, you can also watch this newscast live on this free CBC Gem app. CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. You can follow both of us and Johanna on Instagram as well. A surge in the UK has residents worried about what the winter ahead looks like. How Boris Johnson is reassuring Brits next. And thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. A trip home during the pandemic can be a complicated challenge, especially if you're heading to a different province. But a clever data scientist from Ottawa figured out how to make maximum use of his vacation time on a trip back to New Brunswick, even while quarantining for 14 days. Ryan Brido turned an old Volkswagen camper, a van in fact, into a cozy rolling home office. The CBC's Shane Fowler got a tour of the vehicle, affectionately dubbed Lieutenant Van. So here's a quick tour of uh, Lieutenant Van. I've got two 100 watt solar panels along with a cell, a cell phone booster on the left, the Wi-Fi booster on the right. That way it doesn't matter where I park, I can always make sure I have um, a good connection so that I can work from it. Now going inside, I have a, uh, this is kind of the middle of the day, so I have it set up as my office right now. And so I have the, uh, the back, uh, back seat up. I've got my laptop out on the uh, fold-away table along with my, uh, my monitor. Uh, I have uh, two gas burners that connect to the propane tanks at the bottom. Uh, I have a small sink. Uh, I've got a small refrigerator that all runs off of the solar power. Uh, and then inside this cabinet here you can see uh, the lithium-ion battery that's uh, connected to the solar panels. Um, also have a gas heater down here that connects to the gas tank as well, uh, which helps keep things warm at night uh, without having to depend on the electricity. The back seat here too, it folds into a bed at night, so I can uh, fold that down flat. You can see a bit of the mattress on the back. Uh, that simply folds down over top of the back seat. Um, and it's about six feet long, so it gives you lots of space as long as you're not too tall. And up top, uh, we have this pop-up canopy uh, that you can uh, set up and, and kind of unzip different sections for extra airflow. Um, I use it as the back part of kind of storage during the day, so I keep my toolbox, a lot of my bedding up there during the day. Uh, but as you can see, there's actually a, a, fold -out, a fold out panel right here as well. That you can fold down to make an entire second bed. So, you can sleep about four pretty comfortably um, as long as you don't mind being uh, in pretty tight quarters. I was going to say this guy is ahead of his time, but uh, remember the, the good old days when we went out and covered news in microwave trucks and satellite trucks and stuff? And I do. All the uh, <laughs> operators would uh, turn the chair around, you'd have a monitor, you'd have a That's laptop true. there. No Dyson fan in no, there like he had Dyson in there, as fan. I spotted. <laughs> a few things extra for him. He, yeah. had, he had a long way to go, though. He did. Mm -hmm. Very cozy digs, though. That was nice. All right, we're going to be back with some more news. COVID-19 across the country. Stay with us. More than 600 new cases of COVID-19 were announced in Ontario today, and new modeling suggests it could nearly double that number within the next couple of weeks. As Mike Crawley explains, the modeling also suggests hospitals will struggle if new infections start spreading rapidly among older populations. Fall is firmly here in Ontario, and today, more than a week after the official start of the season, Ontario released its fall preparedness plan for COVID-19, a plan to prepare for a second wave that has already arrived. Cases are doubling every 10 to 12 days now. By mid-October, Ontario could see 
1,000 new cases a day. That projection comes from new modeling released today by the province, reported first by CBC News on Monday. One of the biggest concerns, rising infections among older age groups. If you see a growth uh, in our uh, older population in terms of the cases, you will see a growth as well uh, in the number of deaths. Another worry, the impact on intensive care. Officials say if more than 150 COVID patients end up in ICU, it becomes hard for hospitals to continue scheduled surgeries. If that number exceeds 350, it becomes impossible. That's in part why some doctors want the government to roll Ontario's COVID restrictions back to stage two. Yet today, a different group of doctors said the rise in case numbers simply doesn't warrant it. There is a significant increase in activity since the summer, but it's not alarming or overwhelming, and I don't think it deserves such a dramatic response by the government. There are no signs that the government is poised to impose stage two right now. We're cognizant of closing down too many businesses without data to support that uh, as a draconian measure. We aren't rolling back today. I'm not saying it's never going to happen. But today, that's not a conversation that's going to happen in Cabinet. While today's number of new COVID-19 cases in Ontario is not a record, the percentage of people testing positive hit its highest rate in four months. Mike Crawley, CBC News, Toronto. Now, despite posting broadly similar numbers, Quebec is taking a radically different approach than Ontario. As Alison Northcott explains, the province is now ramping up punishments for those breaking protocols. Lining up for something that will soon be off limits, visiting the museum. It's the last day to be here and I thought I should utilize the opportunity. Effective at midnight, new restrictions in three parts of Quebec. Movie theaters and bars will close, restaurants limited to takeout and delivery. We just wanted to grab a bite before they all close down and, you know, support local businesses, I guess. Now, the government has to enforce the new rules, which also include a ban on private gatherings inside and out. If you're inviting guests for a party, you're breaking the law. So it's giving police more tools to issue tickets on the spot for some violations and get warrants more quickly, remotely, so they can enter homes where they suspect illegal gatherings are happening if the homeowner won't cooperate. Be uh, very fast and easier to give a fine of $1,000. Also new, mandatory masks at protests, even when the protest itself is against masks, like this one in Montreal tonight. Protesters who don't comply after today could be fined $1,000. For some, giving more tools to police raises serious concerns. Finding solution for people um, to continue their life without necessarily being together is best than giving more power to police officers. As we know, there's a lot of abuses, of brutality and everything. So this just opens also new doors to that. The first thing is really um, keeping the message clear. This behavioral science expert says enforcement can be effective to get compliance quickly, but the messaging around it is key. You need to give them reasons. You need to show them how you are personally going to benefit from adhering to these policies, how we're all going to benefit, not just the vulnerable and the sick. The premier said it is urgent to act because negligence on the part of a small number of people is putting lives at stake. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Health Canada is giving the green light to a rapid testing device that can determine whether someone has COVID-19. The ID now can be used in locations like pharmacies, doctor's offices, and walk-in clinics. Results are produced in 15 minutes. Its approval comes one day after Ottawa announced it would buy almost 8 million of the tests from a U.S.-based laboratory. Government says it is expecting to receive the first batch in the coming weeks. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is confident about the UK's ability to deal with coronavirus this winter. That confidence might be more easily accepted if cases weren't surging and if he didn't seem so muddled on his own policy. Margaret Evans shows us how that's playing out. One rule to confuse them all, even it would seem the government imposing it. This was the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson yesterday, asked to explain how England's rule of six on social distancing will work in areas facing greater restrictions as of today. You should follow the guidance of, of, uh, of local authorities, uh, uh, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's six in, in, in a home or six in, 
in hospitality, but uh, as I understand it, not six outside. Not quite. And soon, Johnson was tweeting out an apology. Just trying to understand one rule and then another one comes in and then you're thinking, oh, well. It's just very confusing of what to do. It's changing every single day. There's no doubt, though, that Britain's numbers are headed in the wrong direction. More than 7,000 new infections in a 24-hour period for two days running now. Today, Johnson and his medical advisors warned against complacency. A tragic increase in the number of daily deaths, with 71 yesterday and again today. And these figures show why our plan is so essential. The Labour opposition party says it's starting to question just what the plan is. It does need to be the strategy, there needs to be clear communications, um, and test, trace and isolate still hasn't been fixed. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Johnson is also facing criticism from some of his own Conservative backbenchers, who accuse him of trying to bypass Parliament by rushing through coronavirus measures. And today there was a rebuke from the Speaker of the House. I now look to the government to rebuild the trust with this House and not treat it with the contempt that it has shown. The Prime Minister will also have to work harder at building trust amongst ordinary people. He's seen his rating slide over his handling of the pandemic from a 65% approval rating earlier in the year to just 30% most recently. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Well, we are seeing the smoke here in BC and tonight. Word the two major wildfires in California are getting bigger and are on the move. Just ahead, the latest on the threat to that state's famous wine region. Canada's four national parks in the Rocky Mountains occupy more than 18,000 square kilometers, and yet they're overcrowded. There's enough room for everyone, but visitors aren't using all the space available. As Terry Malevsky reports, they may be missing the best parts. Takakar Falls, it's one of the spectacular sights of the Canadian Rockies. They're in Yoho National Park on the BC side of the mountains, just a short drive off the highway, so it's a well-known sight. But this is not a well-known sight, although it's only a few miles from Takakar Falls. Perhaps only a few hundred of the millions who pass through the park will recognize these as the Twin Falls. It's not as though you have to take a helicopter to get up here, but you do have to get out of your car and actually walk for about three hours. Uh, hardly anyone does. Diane and Ron Cluster did. They came all the way from Iowa and found themselves alone here. What do you say to those who never come? They're foolish for not walking up here. They really are. It's beautiful. And this is just such spectacular scenery up here. It's uh, Everybody ought to try to get out and see it. And really, the only way you see it is on the back trails. You don't see it from the highway. Which, for most people, means you don't see it at all. And it's the same story all over the parks. This, for example, is one of the most photographed scenes in Canada. Lake Louise in neighboring Banff Park. Millions come here unaware that just the other side of those mountains are the Seven Vales Falls at Lake O'Hara. You don't even have to walk here. You can take a short bus ride, but that's too much for all but a few hundred each year. Roughly seven million people from all over the world pass through Banff National Park every year. But pass through is the right phrase, because of that seven million, maybe 60,000, fewer than 1%, ever get off the highway. The modern park visitor is motorbound, wedded to his wheels. The campers just will not stray from their power hookups. And the wardens wonder why. 7,000 square miles of park between the, the four adjacent parks, and uh, that's a lot of land. So if we can get them dispersed out and, and get them out to where they can see some, something other than Banff Avenue here, well, uh, I think uh, we got lots of room for them. Terry Malewski, CBC News. Banff National Park. And finally tonight, to recap. The National Energy Board has determined that financing for the Alaska gas pipeline is sound, which virtually clears the way for construction of the project. 
In his first news conference since returning from Iran, Richard Queen has said he was not brainwashed during his captivity in the U.S. Embassy. And a strike and a lockout have shut down Newfoundland's fishing industry for the first time in the history of the province. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. For somebody to say that they design particularly for white people and that they're kind of better at it, I find that very offensive and somewhat racist. A Vancouver fashion designer is facing criticism from a group of Indigenous artists who are outraged by her claims of authenticity. Chloe Angus licenses Coast Salish Designs and markets her company as partially Indigenous owned, but that isn't true. Angus says though she is an ally and wants to help support Indigenous art, but she won't be changing how she works. So we've really posed the problem here. We've said the areas we need the most help in, and now it's up to them to come back to us and say what they're willing to do about it. Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart joins a group of 13 BC mayors in making their pitch to the province's campaigning political party leaders. They want long-term funding for transit, mental health and addictions, affordable housing, and funding for municipalities. BC health officials announced 125 new cases of COVID-19 today. Dr. Bonnie Henry says there have been no new deaths, leaving the death toll at 234 people. 72 patients are in hospital with 21 in intensive care. Public health is actively monitoring 3,200 people who are in self-isolation due to COVID-19 exposure. Wildfires continue to burn across California. And more than two dozen people have died in fires so far this year. And two new major fires have quadrupled in size. They are burning in the state's famous wine country, a region that has faced significant fire events in the past. Up to 70,000 people are now under evacuation orders. And our meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is back with more on this story. Johanna, we are hearing that dozens of structures have been lost uh, and thousands of homes evacuated. What, what's the latest tonight? These fires escalating as we speak, Mike and Leanne. In fact, the glass fire that has burnt the most structures, only 2% contained tonight. And we talked about this on the show yesterday, that 143 British Columbia firefighters are down there assisting the 1,500 uh, personnel that are working on these fires. Uh, and again, the situation is moving quickly i want to show you pictures from glass fires the latest uh, latest pictures we have these are the, the this is the one that quadrupled in size it is now over 48,000 acres in size uh this fire has destroyed 52 structures in napa county 28 in sonoma and many of these structures connected to the vineyards uh, including some very old vineyards a uh, michelin star restaurant uh, 22,000 structures are also at risk right now. So this is why our fire crews are working so hard uh, to protect more structures being burnt. And this is an area that has seen fire fatigue. We have seen fires move through the Napa Valley for the past three years. Uh, they're burning new areas and threatening different structures and vineyards. But again, everyone in this area feeling the fire fatigue. Uh, take a listen to officials about why it's so hard uh, to fight the fires right now. Um, and they're uh, utilizing both helicopters and fixed wing assets uh, to drop retard and drop uh, water and that. But it's, uh, it's a lot of area. It's a huge area and doing the best we can with the resource we have available. Every available firefighter that could work came to work and went to work and most of them are still out there uh, supporting the incident. A garden hose is not going to protect your home. You need to leave so that we, the first responders in the field, can protect you. There are about 70,000 people under the evacuation order. And again, with just 2% containment and winds looking to, uh, well, winds are gusty right now. Uh, this is a very active situation. Uh, already the estimation, uh, Mike and Leanne, for damage is about $8 million, And that's not including any assessment on a personal property. We really don't know uh, exactly what has been burnt tonight. Just frightening and so sad to see that down there, Joe. And I know often when I talk to winemakers, they always talk about climate change because, as we can tell, the weather has not been helping the situation. And, you know, what's, what's the outlook ahead? 
Yeah, you said it, Leanne. Uh, hot and dry has been such a big part of the story uh, for the past few months across uh, California. Let me show you the conditions right now. I mentioned gusty winds. We have red flag warnings in place for those areas in pink, including just north of San Francisco to the wine counties who have already taken a hit uh, because of the pandemic and because of the smoke affecting uh, the vineyards. This ridge that we're under, that's bringing the dry weather to California as well. Take a look at the rainfall accumulation for the next four days. Nothing for California. So I will keep an eye on those winds and uh, keep you posted over the next few days. Okay, very good. And we'll see you again in a bit with the local forecast. Thanks, Joe. Sounds good. A stunning police investigation in Ontario, a suburb there, a mansion hiding a luxury casino. What else was inside next? And at 6.39 p.m., there's a live look out towards the Canby Street Bridge. A warm night, and as Joe showed us, a hazy day for the South Coast. How long is that smoke going to hang around? Her forecast is next. On your street, hoo, hoo, hoo. on your street, hoo, hoo, hoo. on your street, hoo, hoo, hoo. on your street. He, he, he. Hi, my name is Paula C. Nalekut from Porter Grave, Newfoundland, Labrador. This summer, I won a t-shirt design contest for Orange Shirt Day. Here's my winning design. On it, you can see a few indigenous signs. I hope everybody remembers to wear the orange shirt on September 30th. This is Policy Naltuk reporting from Porter the Grave, Newfoundland, Labrador. Back to you, CBC. On your street. My grandma and I, I grew up uh, visiting her and spending lots of time with her in Teslin. And walking around at nighttime in the winter, and I always look up and I could see all the ribbons in the air. And um, Grandma would tell me, shh, don't look, don't look, bad luck. And it was the Northern Lights. And I was like, why can't I look? They're so beautiful, right? And uh, she said, it's bad luck. But she did say that it's bad luck because it's spirits. So. When we're looking up at them, we're actually looking at spirits. So there's people who have passed on in a bad way or a hard way. So that could mean a suicide or it could be a murder or something in a bad way. So that's what um, Klingit people believe in. And that sometimes when you look up, sometimes it almost looks like a circle. And it, to me, it looks like people are holding hands and it looks like they're dancing in a circle. And we say that's our ancestors. And so, um, those ancestors, because they died in a bad, hard way, their spirits get lonely. And so therefore, they want company. They want to take somebody from the earth to come with them. And so they could come down and take you. If you look at them or you draw attention, that's why we say never whistle at them. So that's what grandma told me. And I'm like, I'm not going to argue with grandma. No. She's the boss. Who's back? Johanna Wagstaff now with the forecast. We, we did, uh, as you said, uh, have quite a bit of uh, smoke, high, high level smoke in the region uh, throughout the day today, uh, but certainly not as bad as uh, the last time. Uh, I think everyone breathing a, a bit of a sigh of relief 
uh, when we saw that red sun this morning and the haze, uh, the air quality health index really didn't go above one or two for Metro Vancouver through the day. So hoping it stays high level. That's what I'm seeing in the models. Uh, let me show you the bigger picture because we've got a couple of other blips in our high pressure ridge, starting with cloud that's actually moving in as we speak. So what we're seeing right now out there is high level smoke, but it's going to turn into high level cloud uh, from the edge of this ridge. It's just sort of looping back in on itself. So look at this Thursday through most of the day, mainly cloudy. I think we'll see some sunny breaks towards the afternoon. And just like that, clearing back out for Friday as that ridge sort of reestablishes itself, uh, straightens out, if you will. Uh, keeping on keeping that uh, ridge in place through the weekend but i think we'll actually get more of a westerly flow so once again this is uh, the upper level temperatures but it's really doing a nice job of showing us the different air masses so we're on, in this very warm air mass that extends down to california it stays in place through friday and then look at this saturday into sunday the pattern shifts and we get more of a a westerly influence that will hopefully clear out the high level smoke that we have but it doesn't disappear completely so I think through the weekend into early next week, we can expect a mix of sun and cloud and above seasonal temperatures, but a little bit more of a westerly breeze rather than the all blue skies we were seeing, well, until the haze anyway. So I've got the smoke, the smoke and the clouds in the forecast for tomorrow, clearing out on Friday, but if we've got any lingering smoke, uh, that should uh, be swept out Saturday and Sunday. Not a bad forecast though, a cooler overnight, but still above our seasonal of around nine for this time of the year and afternoon highs also above seasonal. I don't see any rain until Tuesday. So uh, lots for everyone right now in the forecast. Well, a little variety is good, I guess. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Okay, a sprawling mansion with an exclusive casino and spa hidden behind its walls. Everything from slot machines, table games, to top shelf alcohol available inside, all protected by fully loaded firearms. The secret gambling spot was operating in the greater Toronto area, but as Greg Ross explains, police have now seized the 20,000 square foot luxury home. It was an investigation that lasted months, dubbed Project Endgame by police. This is a video of a police raid of the mansion in Markham on July 23rd, and police say what they found inside was nothing short of shocking. We arrested 29 people, including the owner operator, and seized 11 firearms with thousands of ammunition, gaming tables and machines, one and a half million dollars of alcohol and one million dollars of cash. Police had some of these items on display today, including this AR-15 rifle found in one of the bedrooms. This firearm was fully loaded with a 30 round magazine and available within easy access to anyone in the room. Police called it a high-end operation, complete with armed guards and high-tech video surveillance. Police say gaining access to these gates was by invite only. But once inside, clients were offered bed and breakfast style accommodations, a casino with gaming tables and slot machines, as well as a number of other expensive services. Gamblers had access to accommodation, spa treatments, high-end food and beverage services. Human sex trafficking is also suspected and is under investigation. Also in the basement was a full cash bar with over 4,000 bottles of top shelf alcohol and a full wine cellar valued at $1.5 million. In all, 29 people were charged and are facing a total of 74 offenses. They were all Canadian residents, but police say it's quite possible this gaming house had clientele that spanned the globe. We heard the same uh, or had the same uh, intelligence that people were coming um, from all over essentially, but also from China to gamble at this location. Police have seized all of the gambling equipment and the mansion itself, which they say is valued at $9 million. They say the owners of the home and those running the casino all had ties to organized crime. Greg Ross, CBC News, Markham. During last night's raucous, messy presidential debate in the U.S., there was one stunning moment. Donald Trump was asked to condemn white supremacists. He didn't. Instead, he seemingly offered encouragement. Katie Simpson now with the reaction. Stand back and stand by. The man who nearly spit out his beer 
That's Gavin McInnes, the Canadian founder of the right-wing extremist group, The Proud Boys. He watched the debate while doing a podcast. Did you just say Proud Boys stand down and stand back? He did a general command. He's the general of the Proud Boys. I control the Proud Boys, Donald. <laughs> The group is known for violence, racism, and hate. And while it has Canadian roots, pockets of support have sprung up in response to American anti-racism protests. When asked directly last night, the president didn't condemn the group. Proud boys, stand back and stand by, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left. What Donald Trump said appeared to energize the Proud Boys. Stand Back and Stand By was adapted into its logo and shared online. He knows these people support him, so he won't call them out. The backlash did seem to get to Trump, and by this afternoon, he clarified his position. I don't know who Proud Boys are, but whoever they are, they have to stand down, let law enforcement do their work. <laughs> Trump supporters at a debate watching party cheered when he defended his record on racism and unrest. There is raw anger about protests and looting, which have divided the country since the police killing of George Floyd. So what are we talking about? A few abusive police that went after uh, people in the black community, they go after white people too. You have to get rid of the abusive police. Bob Kunst is agitated and a stranger offers comfort. God bless you, brother. You are 100% right. Thank you. Thank you. They may be men of different generations, but they share a frustration one that unites many in Trump's base. I marched with Dr. King. I've always been there with the black men, but I'm not putting it with this crap any longer. We either have a discussion on black and black violence and get to the point, or don't talk to me at all. I don't want to hear it. And don't keep on yelling at me because I'm white that I'm a racist. I'm over all of it. And I'm angry. Anger helped Trump win in 2016. He's looking to rely on that again this time. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Cleveland, Ohio. The president also drilled down last night on an oft-repeated theme, the possibility of sweeping election fraud. Susan Ormiston looks at more fallout from an unprecedented debate. Put away, Joe. After that chaotic debate, Joe Biden left town on a train to campaign, but with a parting jab at his opponent. The president of the United States conducting himself the way he did, um, I think was just a, a national embarrassment. President Trump, departing for his own rally in Minnesota, returned the compliment. By every measure, we won the debate easily last night. I think he was very weak. He looked weak. He was whining. I'm not going to answer the question Why because you answer that last question? night was as much brawl as debate, so disruptive. Will you shut who is up, man? Listen, who the debate commission list? promised today it would amend the rules for the next two, perhaps adding a kill switch on the mics. Keep yapping, man. Again, Trump lobbed a veiled threat that this election would be rigged. Will you urge your supporters to stay calm, not to engage in any civil unrest? President Trump, I'm you go first. I'm urging my supporters to go into the polls and watch very carefully because that's what has to happen. I have your ballot here today. Implying that ballot fraud will lead to a dirty result that he won't automatically accept, in spite of multiple studies which show no coordinated major election voting fraud. Ballots are being sent to cats that have been dead for 12 years. Post-debate, Trump's family piled on the flawed election theme. Donald Trump has to win by such an overwhelming margin of victory on November 3rd, they cannot dispute the results of this election, no matter how many dead cats are voting. He uh, already began to plant his seeds of doubt in the legitimacy of this election. I don't know any president's ever done that before. Many Americans say they woke up to a kind of debate hangover with some fading confidence for a smooth election. There were some calls to cancel the two remaining debates, but both Biden and Trump's campaign team say they'll be there, especially as more than 65 million Americans watched that political slugfest. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Washington. It is a unique hotel in one of the country's most majestic places. How this landscape hotel on Whitehorse is adapting the COVID restrictions next.
So imagine finishing a dream project, a new hotel in the Yukon Forest. But just as it's ready to open, COVID-19 hits and decimates the tourism industry. As Philippe Morin reports tonight, the owner is now looking forward to a second chance. The hotel is part treehouse, part tiny house, with four small units nestled among the trees. The idea is a landscape hotel, so they're, they're more popular in Europe, and the concept is to set the units into the natural landscape. And typically they have huge front windows that kind of lets the, the natural beauty in to the guests. And so that, that's what we're trying to recreate here. It's all rock and, and trees, so construction is definitely a little more challenging here. Um, every single thing has been carried in on our shoulders. The design is full of surprises. This black finish isn't paint. Last winter, Herbert burned spruce planks on one side. It's a Japanese technique for sealing the wood. That inspired the name, the Black Spruce Hotel. The rooms are just about 300 square feet, with everything you need. It's all, it's all powered. Um, they're all electric heat. Uh, the water and the sewer is actually the most complicated part of the build. Herbert built most of these units himself with some help over the last year and a half. Construction was mostly done before COVID-19. Now the question is, how do you open a hotel when air passengers to Yukon and border crossings are down more than 95%? It kind of sent us in a bit of a spiral, um, laid off the crew and just kind of waited to see. So we haven't actually opened uh, over the summer just kind of been reevaluating the business plan and trying to come up with a strategy to uh, counter COVID. And I think now we're just going to go for it and take a chance and see, see what happens with bookings. The Black Spruce Hotel should be open for bookings next month, just as Northern Lights tourism begins. For now, it's a dream on hold, but one Herbert says he's close to seeing through. Philippe Morin, CBC News, Whitehorse. What a beautiful space. I hope they make it. Yeah, it's very different, very unique. Mm hmm indeed. When maybe while I'm on that leave, I can bring baby there. Check it out. <laughs> Who knows? Head to the forest. That's right. <laughs> All right, that does it for us tonight. You can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. Dan is here at 11 right after the National. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>